Brooklyn Independent Television. Hello, welcome to Neighborhood Beat, your passport to Brooklyn. I'm your host, Aaron Watkins, and in this exciting episode, we pay homage to our borough's artistic spirit by visiting four different artists in four various neighborhoods. Our first stop will be with Dumbo painter Jen Ferguson and her whimsical watercolors. Then we'll head over to Bay Ridge to visit Isabel Garbani, who uses plastic bags to create unique art. Next, we'll catch up with Brooklyn quilt girl, Sylvia Hernandez in Williamsburg, before we experience multimedia art and music from Carl Ferrero and Red Hook. Stay tuned. You need to get around Manhattan and Brooklyn via the waterways? No problem. A new East River ferry service connecting East 34th Street, Greenpoint, North and South Williamsburg, and Dumbo recently launched right here at Fulton Ferry Landing. The $4 one-way fare is year-round and even accommodates bikes. Evoking both whimsy and disquiet, Jen Ferguson is an awesome Dumbo-based painter whose work encompasses everything from monsters to architecture. She even has a series on Brooklyn bridges. So, let's check out her fascinating artistic process. My name is Jen Ferguson. I'm a painter. Uh, as far as genre, I like to paint a lot of different things. I paint oils. Um, the work is constantly evolving. It's definitely figurative, meaning you can tell what things are, but they're not realistic. I've been painting as long as I can remember. Ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted a horse, so I started by drawing horses constantly. I um, decided not to study art so that I could avoid the way I was being taught in college. And also, I love literature, so it was a way to nurture my visual vocabulary. And then, I, you know, I never thought it would be a profession. I always thought it would be something that I did um, religiously with dedication, but not necessarily as a day job. And eventually, it just evolved into a full-time profession, so to speak. There hasn't been a clear path, unnecessarily. It's all been kind of trying to learn how to run a small business. And I've just been really fortunate to have a little group of people that supports my work. And I've been very fortunate to be in this neighborhood where the arts are encouraged and there are opportunities for people to, to show their art. Like all the merchants in the area are very generous about wall space. And then there's a Dumbo Arts Festival. So I feel like part of being in Dumbo has, has been good for my career in that way. And then as far as career path, and people say, well, how do you do it? Like, how do you, how do, you do it as an artist? Like, I think you pretty much sacrifice all the normal things that you would want to have. And your primary dedication has to be to your art. And then if you're really lucky and people like your work, then you can kind of have a career. But it means being dedicated constantly and not getting too distracted off of that path. And like taking risk too, which I know sounds very cliche, but if you don't try to push your art, then you're guaranteed not to succeed. And pushing your art means not just doing what other people have wanted you to do in the past. It means like, and also not knowing what you're doing. Like you have to be okay with not knowing what you're doing. And you kind of have to be okay with failure a lot. And that has to be part of the process. Slack-jawed, blonde, Midwest families amble through Dumbo and sip hot chocolate at Jacques Torres. They wouldn't have chosen to be here in the 80s. A lot of cab drivers wouldn't even take you here. It was beautiful, desolate, no retail, just dark factory buildings and warehouses on cobblestone streets with stunning views of bridges and packs of wild dogs roaming and foaming I teach children here in the studio privately, and I really love it, and it happened by accident. I thought it would be really fun to do a show of art for children that they can, that's hung lower at their level and they can look at it. At the opening, I, I had a little table, like a kid's table, with some crayons and paper and stuff, and 
All the kids, after they would look at the art, they would run over the table and start drawing. And then I've happened upon it by accident, but then I found out that it's really great and I love it. It's so much fun to share what I love doing. Well, I'd like to show you some of the work in my studio. I have a Dracula who is at a masquerade ball. Above him, I have a pig who used to hang in Blue Ribbon. People having dinner, maybe were a little nervous eating their pork chop watching him. So I love to go to Aqueduct Racetrack and draw the people there. So these are some of my models, and they usually stay in one place for a long time. Now I'm going to show you some other work, so follow me. So, I would like to show you now, this is King Kong. This is also for the Monster Mashup show last year. He um, inadvertently has broken the Empire State Building. He's very upset about it. And over here, we have art from the first issue of Cousin Corinne's Reminder. And this is depicting uh, Easter on the F train, which I always imagined would have the bunny rabbit commuting to his many stops. Now I'd like to show you some stuff in progress so you can see what's up. So this is um, some of my new work that I'm really pushing the paint on and I love color so this is mainly about the warm tones. It looks like a lot of chaos now because it's very much in progress, meaning I just started it. It will evolve into something, it's sort of like a puzzle. I start putting the paint on and then things kind of suggest themselves to me. Being in Dumbo is going to have like an indelible mark on my work. Also, not only because of the bridge work, but because I've just created so much work in the neighborhood. I wouldn't be painting the Brooklyn Bridge if I weren't right here. The bridge has kind of evolved through different parts of my work. It does kind of keep showing up in the work. Although I wonder when I move out of Dumbo, if there'll be, you know, there'll be other things that, that influence it. I do think it's a good time to be an artist. It's always a good time to be an artist. It's a little harder to sell things when people have less discretionary income. At the same time, a lot of us artists are used to having fluctuating income. And so it takes the scary bit of the economy doing badly out of it a little bit. Like I, and you can't really get fired from yourself. Not only that, but uh, doing art relieves a lot of stress. And it's so fulfilling. If that's what you are meant to do, then it, I think it would be worse having a different job right now. Behind me is what started in 1895 as the Salem Evangelical Lutheran Church designed by Scandinavian architect Carl Jensen. It was here serving Bay Ridge until 1995 when another fine pastor, Father Kadir al Yutin, took over on behalf of the Salem Lutheran Evangelical Church. But now progress as we call it is going to result in this beautiful church coming down and another apartment house taking its place. They call it progress, we're not so sure. Isabel Garbani is a special artist, very special because all of her work is with plastic bags. What a way to recycle. My name is Isabel Garbani and I'm a mixed media artist. I uh, work primarily with plastic bags uh, and I've been working with plastic bags for about three years now. I either use them as collages or as sculptural elements and I'm currently working on an installation on Governor's Island. I've always been interested in plastic itself as a material because I think it's very um, um, representative of uh, our culture and I like the way it looks, I like the way it feels, the way that it's, um, it's very fragile and yet it lasts forever and we can't get rid of it. So, you know, it's got some really good qualities um, that I think really represent what I want to say in my art. So the way I start for the knitting um, is I have a regular shopping bag and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off the handles. I'm going to cut off the seam, pull the bag and I'm going to fold it up and I'm going to cut every inch or so. And I open it up. And I'm going to do a first cut here at the very top and I'm going to do that all the way across. And then you're going to have one long 
strands. Then I roll it into uh, a yarn and I can start knitting with it. That's what I've been doing. So I wanted to show you one more thing, uh, how to recycle um, the plastic bags. Um, and same thing, you're going to take a bag and you're going to cut off the seam and the handles. So usually fold it into four. And then you take wax paper and you're going to put the bag inside the wax paper. And you need to do this in a really well ventilated area because it produces toxic gases. We're going to iron the plastic bag until it melts together. Basically, this is what it's going to look like. So I moved to Bay Ridge in 2005. And basically at the time I moved there because um, my, my boyfriend slash partner, we were trying to find something that would be inconvenient for both of us. <laughs> uh, but you know, sort of in between and you know, that, could, that we could afford. And um, it's a great neighborhood for restaurants, uh, a lot of stores, very diverse neighborhood. You know, there's all kinds of ethnicities that live there, which is really nice. It's very difficult to change our lifestyle, especially in the city. You know, you go get Chinese takeout and you forget to get something on your way home and you stop at the grocery store and, you know, you get a plastic bag. And part of the work that I want to do is actually, you know, point that out. It's very difficult for us to make significant changes, you know, even though we, we want to try and we are mindful of that in the city. Right, so it's, um, this is some of my work uh, that I wanted to show you in the studio. This is uh, what I did at the uh, New York Academy of Art. So uh, we did what's called an écorché, where you basically do a human skeleton in clay. So I actually turned to plaster to try to mimic what I felt um, the plastic could do. So this is a sample of uh, one of the pieces that I made. The white is plaster and this is steel. Moving on, I um, basically gave up sculpture because I could not really quite figure out how to work with plastic and sculpture. Um, so what I found was a way to um, recycle plastic. So basically you could uh, recycle a plastic bag and make it into something like this, which is um, sort of like a very thick vinyl. And I started using that um, as background. So all those pieces here are all made of um, plastic bags in the background. And they're all recycled plastic bags. And then I would draw on top and those drawings were all made from uh, drawings I had done in the subway of people. Finally, uh, this year, I'm gonna use knitting with plastic bags and use that on Governor's Island. And those are gonna go around trees. I have one more piece I'd like to show you, um, right over there. So this is the last piece that I've done and my process now is just a little bit different. So instead of recycling the plastic uh, with heat, I just use the plastic as is and I draw directly on top. And basically that allows me to have a much finer um, line quality for the drawing because that was really important to me to retain that. And now I've moved on, I'm, I'm working um, uh, with landscape uh, and I'm really interested in how the environment and the urban environment kind of interact with each other. Um, so this is the first piece that hopefully is going to start the new series um, after the Governor's Island installation is over. So um, thank you very much for visiting my studio and uh, if you'd like more information about my work, my website is www.isabelgarbani.com. This sculpture of George Washington, known as George Washington at Valley Forge, serves as a centerpiece of the Brooklyn Continental Army Plaza in Williamsburg. Located at the approach to the Williamsburg Bridge, the statue, dedicated in 1906, depicts the Commander-in-Chief during the six-month period from December 1777 to June 1778 when the Continental Army was encamped at Valley Forge. Sylvia Hernandez grew up in Williamsburg. She remembers when the streets weren't so kind, and like many New Yorkers, she's seen her share of hard times. She's an artist specializing in what she terms memory quilts and other art forms. She's a mother, sister, wife, daughter, but to most, she's simply known as the Brooklyn Quilt Girl. I can uh, 
honestly say I don't remember how I started quilting. I don't know what it was, it was a calling, that's all I can say. I learned how to sew uh, in the fourth grade. I got an old machine and I just went with it. My name is Sylvia Hernandez and this is my quilt studio in uh, Brooklyn, Williamsburg, um, the neighborhood I grew up in. So I've seen this neighborhood change from, from the very worst to the, you know, to what it is now, to now the fabulous Williamsburg. But I was here when nobody wanted to come to Williamsburg. I am a medical assistant and uh, after three o'clock, I run out of the office and I come to my studio to work, to make my quilts. The building we're located in used to be the school for our church, for the Church of the Epiphany. I actually took my first communion classes in this room. It was abandoned. The priest helped us out. He knew I needed a studio, so he let me come in here. We cleaned it up and here we are. I've made memory quilts. Memory quilts incorporated uh, memories of the person. They can bring me uh, stuff that belonged to them. I have uh, quilts that are made from old clothing from people that have passed. This particular quilt was made for uh, a friend of my son. Her name was Monica. She was killed in a hit and run accident and I put this together for the friends. She was a tattoo artist, she was a musician. So everything that's in here has something to do with what she was. There are photos of her on there also. On this particular skeleton, I put the articles that were in the newspaper uh, about her. And at first I thought it was a bit dark, but I, I felt that it was something that had to be said. I started out in art school. I wanted to take up illustration. Um, I had to stop because I was pregnant and um, I was in the 10th grade. So I, I stopped to take care of my son to, to do the mommy thing. And, and then I had another child much later, but once I was done with them and they were off to college, I came back to the arts. But instead of illustration, I do it in fabric now. This particular piece, is for an exhibit a friend asked me about for 9-11. All of these are covers or pictures that I put away 10 years ago. I put them away, they had no clue what I was gonna do with them. Um, I pulled them out last week and you know what? It was as painful last week as it was 10 years ago. This picture here is my son. He went, he goes to, he went to Stuyvesant. Um, the Spectator was the newspaper, the newsletter for the school. It had a huge impact on him. He still doesn't talk about it. Doesn't wanna talk about it, so it's okay and hopefully it'll be in a show sometime soon. If I've had a stressful day or if I'm upset, I do not touch it. Because I feel like you put your negative energy into anything that you're working on when you're in that kind of a mood. And anybody that is negative or that way is not allowed into the space. <laughs> Including my husband, who I adore. If he's acting crazy, he knows he needs to stay outside <laughs> until he calms down so we can get on to it. He, those are the rules. There's no quilting police in here, there's no grumpy people, no negative, it just doesn't fit in here. Anybody that comes in here usually feels that, that it's okay. Whatever you're doing here, it's not a mistake, it's not a mess, it's okay, it's, it's art, so it's cool. I just put the strips together for a piece I, you guys saw before. Just stripping them and then we'll calm down. The difference between this machine and the other machine is that this one is for just putting it together whereas the bigger machine is to quilt it, which gives it the texture. And then I'll cut it down and make triangles. And we'll square them off and put them all together and make one big square. And they go together, they'll look like. My brother passed away a couple of years ago. It was, a, it was a big shock to us. So when I got into his apartment to clean it up, there were certain things that I picked up. He had a Heineken in the refrigerator. So I took the, the cap off and I put it in my pocket. So his quilt consists of a key on it because we couldn't get into his apartment. Uh, one of his tools is on this quilt. His selective service card that he saved from 1966 was still in his pocket. I put a, a copy of his Social Security card because he was this close to retiring. I put screws on it because he was screwed out of Social Security. He waited so long and he missed that. So it was just things that I felt I had to get out of my system so I wouldn't carry it with me forever. Because it was like I was carrying something I didn't need to carry about him anymore. So just to let him rest at peace too, I think I needed to do that. When I was in art school, I, I just loved the, the art, the colors, the, just the creation of something. And in quilting, I find the same thing. I think when I work on something and I give it to somebody, they know it's coming from the heart. It's not something that's just been thrown together and it's not the way I work. When I do my work, I put my whole heart into it. 
And, and I can say 99% of the people that have gotten stuff from me understand it and feel it when I give it to them. The actual hook of Red Hook was a point on an island that stuck out into New York Bay at what is now Dykeman Street, west of Ferris Street. Now in the 1880s to the present time, the people who live in this eastern area of Red Hook, some 11,000 residents, refer to the neighborhood as the Point. Carl Ferrero is a multidisciplined artist who does everything from watercolor paintings to writing lyrics for a pop synth band. So cool. He recently let us know how Red Hook helps form his artistic vision. I'm Carl Ferrero and I am a multimedia artist, mostly focused in painting, sculpture, and installation. Besides my own art practice, I've been working with my partner Andrew and his band UVA, and I've written lyrics, and I've been making videos that we use to project onto the band as they perform. of the music is electropop, it's a little bit new wave, it's kind of ambient but it also uses dance music as an inspiration. Electropop is sort of a good way to describe it. The band started in 2009, gotten really great feedback. Uh, we played in you know sort of traditional music venues and also played in sort of like art galleries and other sort of non-traditional venues. So I think that kind of keeps things interesting, you know. But we've gotten really great feedback. People come back to the shows and uh, seem quite excited, so. I started working with Andrew because, you know, we've been together for a while and we had always wanted to collaborate. And then I was invited to do something performative for an art show, an exhibition I was in and they suggested that Andrew and I work together. So it was sort of the gallery suggested that, and then Andrew said, why don't you make a video? And it was just sort of one of these moments where after that happened, he's like, you should just make videos for every show. So then we just started really working on that. And then I got into writing lyrics because in some of my older work, I've used a lot of writing and words, and Andrew was really into it. And he asked me, he said, would you want to maybe translate this into song lyrics, and that's sort of how that happened. I think Carl's contribution kind of fleshes out uh, the project, kind of gives the music more life, if you will. The video projections add sort of a dreamy, dreamlike quality to the shows. You know, there's only two of us on stage, and uh, I think it just kind of adds a little bit more to the show make things you know, interesting for the audience. I think what inspires me is what I see in the world around me. I feel like my work is based on like a moment of seeing something that connects me to the world, and then I try to translate that into a piece of art. I ended up getting a studio in Red Hook after graduate school, I just happened to find a really great studio space in Red Hook and I just fell in love with the neighborhood. And it's definitely a conducive neighborhood to art. Um, there's a lot of artists out here, there's a lot of artist studios, sort of a uh, seaside landscape that's really, feels really unique and kind of really helpful to, you know, thinking about art and aesthetics. So this first piece here does not have a title, um, and the original inspiration for it was that I wanted to make something that was kind of minimal and sort of almost machine-like in my mind, and combine it with something natural. And so I started with making this cube, and then I ended up cutting my hand. And then I was like, well, why don't I just mess up the cube and make it look bloody and strange? And I had made this little piece of a butterfly and once this piece was done, this cube, I sort of just stuck it in. And somehow it came together for me, or, and I really saw it as this original vision of sort of the inorganic mixing with the organic. 
So the next piece right here was inspired by a trip to upstate New York. We were looking at the house where Andrew grew up and we were seeing all over, it was really covered in snow and trees and then there were these sort of flags that were delineating property. And I've been always trying to like merge representation with abstraction and so that was sort of what was going on here. And then the flags sort of become a more tangible element because they're three-dimensional. And I have another piece to show you this way. So this last piece was inspired by, in science fiction films, when they go into hyperspace, uh, you know, you see all the stars head into one direction. I'm trying to bridge these ideas of, you know, film and that type of imagery with painting and the language and vernacular of painting and modernism. So thanks for coming to my studio. If you want to find out more about my work or see more, it's at carlferrero.com. Well, that does it for this special episode of Neighborhood Beat. I hope my visit will inspire you to experience all of the art that Brooklyn has to offer. For more information on the Neighborhood Beat series or to watch past episodes online, Visit us on the web at brickartsmedia.org slash B-I-T. Feel free to like us on Facebook or contact us on YouTube or iTunes. Search word BK Independent TV. I love Brooklyn, and I know you do too. Peace. Become a fan on Facebook, like Brooklyn Independent Television.